Good afternoon, everyone. This is our African Bar Association presentation. As you, are, as you are aware, the South African Bar Association has a weekly program at no cost to the participants to improve the skill set of the legal profession. We hope to reach a wide spec spectrum of the legal profession from advocates and attorneys to students, both within the Republic of South Africa and abroad. This initiative is aimed at making a fundamental contribution to developing the skill set of all and any persons to represent the South African public in our courts. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our eminent speaker today. Today's speaker is Barrister Patrick Cannon, currently the founder and head of Cannon Chambers. Cannon Chambers is a virtual, or rather the first virtual tax chambers based in the United Kingdom. By way of providing a brief back, back, background, Patrick represents clients in tax appeals and other hearings by video and or in person when required and specializes in both civil and criminal tax investigations and disputes. He is a qualified mediator and conducts virtual mediations. Patrick was previously a solicitor but was called to the English Bar by Lincoln's Inn in 2003. He is a member and champion of neurodiversity in law and is a member of the English Bar Council's Disability Subcommittee. Today, Patrick will be addressing us on the topic of virtual chambers and its relevance in a pre and post COVID-19 environment. Once again, it is my pleasure to, introdu to introduce Patrick to give today's address of which I hand over to you, Patrick. Thank you so much, AJ. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice welcome. And uh, good afternoon uh, to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to have been invited to speak to you uh, about virtual chambers and virtual law. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing so. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, uh, I have enormous respect for the South African bar, uh, having encountered some of the excellent lawyers that you've sent over here to London to practice from time to time. And as a uh, solicitor in my early days, um, I had the privilege of instructing Sir Sidney Kentridge QC um, on a particularly difficult case. And uh, he was typically brilliant. Um, so uh, it has from time to time been uh, a pleasure to work with South African lawyers here in uh, my hometown of London. So I've been asked to speak to you today about virtual chambers. And uh, as we've heard from AJ, I set up my own chambers at the beginning of this year as a WFA uh, or WFH, uh, work from anywhere or work from home set of barristers. Um, I'm tempted to say WFB as well, which is what my, my daughters sometimes do, which is work from bed. Uh, but there is no WFB in Canon Chambers, at least not at the moment, um, if I can help it. Um, and so I thought I'd start with the, the origins and, and, and the reason reasons that led me to create Canon Chambers. Uh, and it's really because the years 2020 and 2021, I think, will be seen by historians uh, as a relatively short but very intense period of disruption and seismic change, but also of new beginnings. Now, in this country, um, in early 2020, we were hit by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with its lockdowns beginning in early March and the necessary changes to the way in which business had to be conducted. Now, one of the effects of lockdown 
was that in-person court and tribunal appearances and office-based work generally was either not permitted or was made much more difficult by the pandemic. So online working um, came rapidly uh, to the fore and the move from working from home uh, happened remarkably swiftly. And in many cases, surprisingly seam seamlessly. Uh, and I would argue that it's going to change the face of the legal profession forever. Now, the impact of the new ways of working um, has had an enormous effect on the landscape for chambers of barristers. And I think the changes can be summarized under four categories. I'll summarize those first and then I'll say a bit more about each one. So the first point to note is the rapid shift by the courts and tribunals to online hearings, which certainly happened here. I'm not knowledgeable about South Africa. I imagine that you've probably experienced the same sort of change. Um, and accompanying that change to online hearings is of course the use of electronic document bundles um, and uh, the absence of paper um, <clears throat> bundles and um, other documents that usually are required for an in-person hearing. The second effect is in relation to webinars. Um, now, in my previous chambers, we did a lot of seminars for clients. And um, I remember that we used to hold them in a very old hall in Lincoln's Inn in London uh, called the Old Hall. And it was built in the 16th century. And giving a talk in that environment was quite challenging. Um, first of all, it could only hold about 120 people. And the acoustics were terrible. Um, and people had to travel long distances. Um, of course, we've moved over very rapidly to giving talks by webinar, such as the webinar we were uh, attending today. And that has, a, has had an enormous uh, effect on the efficiency um, and usefulness, I think, of webinars as a tool for conveying up-to-date um, information. The third topic, I think, are Zoom conferences with clients, um, where we can meet clients remotely and use screen share to review legal documents instead of clients having to travel sometimes long distances uh, in order to have an in-person meeting with their counsel. Zoom conferences and Teams and um, the various other uh, software products have completely revolutionized that aspect of a lawyer's work. And the other interesting effect of the rapid advancing technology has been in relation to mediations. Now mediations of course were traditionally conducted in person and they could be quite difficult if the parties involved did not get along um, and one had to hire rooms, you needed a caucus room and then breakout rooms People had to stay in hotels the night, the night before, there were traveling costs. And of course, if the participants decided to speak over one another uh, or would go on beyond their allotted speaking time, it was sometimes very difficult as a mediator to manage that process. Mediation by Zoom, I found, has completely revolutionized the mediation process. 
and it may, made it more efficient, easier for the mediator to control. And I think because of that has made it a more effective and satisfying experience for um, clients attending the mediation. So they are the four main effects that I see that going virtual in a post-COVID world um, will achieve. Now, just looking at those four topics in a little bit more detail, uh, video hearings in tribunals and courts. Well, my experience since the tribunals here went virtual in around about April, May last year, has been very, very positive. Uh, the adoption of electronic hearing bundles, where one looks at the relevant section of the bundle when one's talking about it or discussing it with the judge or the other side on screen um, is very useful. It avoids piles and piles and folders and folders of paper. Um, the bundles are, of course, searchable. So in practical terms, you look at the index on the left of your screen, you click on the section you want to get to, and there it is. It's all displayed rapidly and um, is very helpful, I find, when examining witnesses. And I've done two hearings this week actually in the tax tribunal where I called witnesses in support of the appellant's cases and we had to examine photographs of the relevant properties and in one case the state of construction of the property at a particular date and uh, if everyone involved is looking at the same photograph on screen and the witnesses describing it. That is a very efficient way to get through the witnesses' evidence uh, with everybody seeing and hearing the witness at the same time as looking at the photo on screen. As a practical matter, that's a huge benefit of uh, virtual hearings. Now, of course, the other benefits are obvious, but they're probably worth stating. With a virtual hearing, you don't have to travel to get to the court uh, and then wait around uh, in a waiting room or a meeting room uh, for the court to, to convene. Um, one simply sits at one's desk at home or in your home office and you wait for the hearing to begin and you can be getting on easily with other things at the same time. And of course, when the hearing ends, um, I know about you, but after a full day's hearing, I'm normally pretty tired. Um, particularly in yesterday's hearing when I was dealing with a judge who was very intelligent, but he knew nothing about the subject matter and the technical rules governing the uh, appellant's case. And so we spent an unusual amount of time with him interrogating me about the technical aspects of the case and what rules applied and how they applied. So at, part, at times it was more like a seminar rather than a usual court hearing. So at the end of the day, I was pretty exhausted. Um, but with a virtual hearing, of course, you end the meeting, you get up, make a cup of tea, and you relax. Um, there's no uh, having to pack one's bag and struggle home, sometimes great distance after the hearing. Um, for example, in, in this country, a lot of hearings are, take place in uh, Birmingham, which is in the Midlands. And it's a good two and a half hours on the train to get back to London. Um, with the usual delays on top added to that. Um, it can be quite late before you get home. And uh, that's no longer the case, of course, with virtual hearings. Now, the president of the tax tribunals here in the UK announced last year 
uh, with the rapid transfer from in-person hearings to video hearings and how well they had gone and how well people had adapted to that process, that he thought that they would become the default here in uh, England now. Uh, and I believe that will be the case. Um, I know there are a few people, very traditional people who do like in-person hearings, and probably some of you as well. And I respect that. But my sense of it is that the majority uh, of lawyers and judges for that matter, prefer virtual hearings. The other aspect of virtual hearings, of course, which may be um, the aspect that drives the move to virtual hearings permanently, are the cost savings, of course, they're huge. If the Ministry of Justice doesn't have to maintain lots and lots of courtrooms in expensive city centre offices, that will represent over time a huge saving of costs. And I think um, as far as they go, that will probably be the driver at the end of the day. Those who um, are responsible for court budgets will see the savings that are being made when, and that are possible to be made uh, and will drive the, the move to, to permanent virtual hearings. Now, of course, there's some, there are some court hearings that really have to be heard in person. Um, and at the moment, I think those, the most obvious category are jury trials. So um, until technology develops to, the, to an extent that people are confident that juries can be properly managed virtually, I think the, um, the default will be to get the jury assembled in the same place in person um, in order to ensure that everything is proper and that they do their job efficiently and, and, and without being influenced. So I think it'll be some time, if ever, that we go to virtual hearings of criminal cases. But of course, all the um, preparatory hearings, um, case management and so on, can still take place virtually. It's really only the hearings where the jury need to be present that I think will remain in person over time. Now, I mentioned a moment ago webinars and how they have replaced in-person seminars and, and talks and how my experience in Old Hall in Lincoln's Inn was pretty negative. Uh, the acoustics were terrible. Wasn't a very comfortable place to be. It was laced with tradition, of course, and history having been built in the 16th century. So it had a certain charm about it. But actually delivering a lecture to 120 people in a, a cold, dark, drafty room with appalling acoustics was quite a challenge. And one really had to put quite an effort in to effectively deliver a lecture, particularly on tax technical topics. Now, I found the switch over to webinars enormously positive. For a start, instead of being limited to 120 people who often had to travel great distance to get there and then struggle home again, um, you can have 300 plus people on webinars. Um, everyone is, if you like, has the benefit of a front row seat because they've got these slides on screen, they've got any documents you want to display immediately in front of them in having to, in some cases, peer over the heads of others from the back of the room at a sort of rather small shaky screen up by the lectern. Uh, and it's simply a more engaging and in personal and personal experience, I find, to deliver talks by webinar. 
And we found that delivering presentations by webinar has really gone down well with people who are not based in London and therefore who no longer have to travel to Lincoln's Inn um, to attend a seminar. So I think webinars have been a huge success in this new environment. And I certainly do not see them ever now being replaced. Um, and I talk to people who attend these and they, most of them say the thought of going back to an in-person um, lecture in a drafty, uncomfortable lecture room somewhere in central London does not appeal. Now related to that technology, of course, are Zoom conferences themselves, um, where we simply hook up with the clients remotely using screen share. That's an enormous beneficial way of meeting clients and conducting Again, I'm sorry, I was muted there for some reason. Again, avoids the need to, um, for clients to travel, sometimes long distances, with all the costs um, and loss of time involved. And it's remarkable, in my experience, how Zoom conferences, Teams, um, and Google Meets have just become second nature now. And in fact, I tend now, just thinking about it, very rarely now have a telephone conference with clients. It's almost always a video conference. Um, and with all the benefits of screen sharing, and we can see each other. Um, and it's simply a more engaging, more effective uh, experience. Now, the other beneficial effect of the new technology has been in relation to mediations. Now, AJ mentioned I was a mediator and I did my first uh, Zoom mediation a little while ago. And uh, I prepared very carefully because as you know, Zoom does contain facilities for mediations in the form of breakout rooms. And uh, for example, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see a category there marked breakout rooms. Now they're remarkably useful in mediations. And I'll just give you an example from the Zoom mediation that I did a little while ago. The, the parties involved um, had fallen out big time and I, I, it's no exaggeration to say, <laughs> detested each other. Um, it was a dispute about value added tax and customs duties. Uh, it didn't involve the tax authority, it was a private dispute between two parties. And because of the personal animosity between the principals involved and the technical nature of some of the discussions, they both felt it necessary to bring along their technical experts to the mediation. So we ended up with 14 people in attendance at the mediation, most of whom were tax experts. And um, a few lawyers were in tow for good measure. One of whom was, shall we say, had difficulty uh, using 10 were using um, who used to use 100 words when 10 would do. Um, so it was potentially going to be a very difficult mediation to manage. And as I touched on earlier, an in person mediation of that nature would be quite challenging uh, because you'd have people in the same room together eyeballing each other and potentially talking over each other, experts disagreeing so on and so forth. 
with a Zoom mediation, I found that one could get the opening presentations done with a time limit of 10, say 10 minutes each. And then you allocate people to their respective breakout rooms. And they have no choice in the matter. Actually, you can't ask them to leave the main room, stop arguing, go to the breakout room, please, and I'll visit you and we'll discuss the matter in more detail. Sometimes people won't do that. They're, they're more interested in having a good argument with the other side. In a Zoom mediation, of course, you simply send them off to the breakout room and they find themselves in a virtual breakout room, uh, whether they like it or not. And uh, you're also able as mediator to say to people speaking, look, I'm allocating you 10 minutes and you must finish at the end of the 10 minutes. And without sounding glib, you can enforce that because you simply mute the microphone after 10 minutes, after fair warning, of course. Now, I found in the mediation I did that although the parties, the principles themselves were very difficult, rather like warring children, um, they seemed to adapt well and respond positively to the sort of firm discipline of the Zoom mediation. So overall, I found the experience as a mediator much more efficient and easier to manage. And I think the clients did as well. And of course, with Zoom mediations, you don't, again, have the bother and the expense uh, of travel, the cost of travel, sometimes staying in hotels the, nights be the night before, and hiring a set of expensive meeting rooms, often in city centers, uh, in order to hold the mediation. So again, I think the cost savings there will be a huge driver. And on top of that, my experience is that the mediation can be conducted far more efficiently, virtually. So they are the four main effects that I've identified in terms of virtual working for lawyers and uh, mediators. Now, there are some other important consequences of working virtually that I think are worth mentioning because they would be enormously valuable to the people involved. The first aspect to talk about is freedom from harassment. Now we have a problem in this country, I'm ashamed to say, with some members of the bar in England um, behaving in traditional ways towards women um, and harassing them. That's mainly women, of course, some men are also harassed. Um, and to be frank, you know, the slap on the bottom, the sexist comment, um, all that sort of nonsense, amazingly, still exists. And the recent cases before that I've seen before the Bar Disciplinary Tribunal, sadly, reflects that. Now, with virtual working, most if not all of the opportunities that these, uh, I can only describe them as dinosaurs who carry out this sort of harassment of young female barristers, um, most of the opportunities to conduct themselves like that simply disappear. Uh, you can't slap somebody's bottom if you're dealing with them on the, on the screen. Um, they're not in a conference room with you. And so virtual working makes the environment a lot safer and more comfortable for the sort of young barristers who might be victims of this sort of unacceptable behavior. 
that's a very positive effect uh, of virtual working. And of course, any, any sexist or insulting or inappropriate comments, the mute button uh, is there uh, and, the, and the video can be muted as well. So that's a huge, a huge plus in my view. Now, related to that is the question of neurodiversity. Now, AJ mentioned I'm a member of an organization, a fairly new organization here in England called Neurodiversity in Law. And that group was set up in order to encourage and support people who are not typical in terms of maybe having Asperger's syndrome or other disabilities, mental or physical, to come into and sustain a career at the bar. And I was pleased because I was a member of the Bar Council's Disability Subcommittee, I was very pleased to be invited by Neurodiversity to, to, to give a, a talk to them, a webinar indeed. And then I was asked to become a champion and I've done a few more webinars with them uh, quite recently. Uh, and it, uh, neurodiversity in law has gained enormous traction in a very short period of time. It's, it's answering a huge unmet need. And I'll just, if there's time, I'll just say a little bit more about that. The move to virtual working is in the main enormously helpful to neurodiverse people. I'll give you a very simple but important example. A lot of neurodiverse people, particularly with Asperger's on the spectrum, find it not only difficult to read other people, body language and verbal language as well, of course, but have great difficulty often in looking people in the eye and maintaining eye contact. It's just the nature of the condition. And I've counseled a number of people with that um, condition who have gone to interviews for what we call pupillage here, in other words, trainee barristers. And uh, they performed subject to one thing, they perform very well, except that they never get an offer. And they suspect it's got something to do with their neurodiverse condition. And a number of people have had difficulty looking their interviewing committee in the eye. And one person I was counseling, very determined character, who I think will do very well at the bar when he eventually arrives at the bar. He made what we call a subject access information request, which is a, a right we have here to obtain interview notes, or in, any, in other words, in other situations, any data that is personal to you. And so he got hold of the interview notes from a number of chambers that he was interviewed by to find out what it was, because he thought the interviews went on the whole very well. And he was puzzled by the fact that he was not getting offers. And sure enough, the notes revealed that he, it was his inability to look the council in, uh, look the interview panel in the eye that counted against him. Um, so that is a roundabout way of illustrating how neurodiverse people, in my experience, feel much more comfortable dealing with other people via virtual working because the looking in the eye issue is not nearly so important. Now, there is, that's not the case with everyone. Um, I was doing a webinar with neurodiversity a little while ago, we had about 120 people on the call. And I, I made this point 
but a few people came back via the chat function to say that they were on the spectrum. They had difficulty interpreting body language and they actually found it useful to be in the court personally in order to better understand uh, the messages or the signals that opposing counsel and the judge were giving off. But in the main, my experience is that neurodiverse people prefer screen-based working. And just quickly, another example that it emerged during that webinar um, was a barrister with that issue who was from time to time being criticized by the judge for not looking or by the judicial panel for not looking at them. And it was quite um, sad because she simply couldn't do it as a result of her condition. And she was asking what she could do to improve her performance in court. And the only idea I could come up with was that uh, either just before the start of the hearing, she has a word with the court usher or the court clerk and explains the position, or if she's bold enough, when she opens uh, her case, she simply explains briefly to the judge that she's neurodiverse and that um, the judge should not um, take her inability to, to look them in the eye uh, as of any significance whatsoever. So neurodiversity, I think, will be enormously assisted by the move to virtual working. Now, I think we, we, we're going to leave about 20 minutes for discussion. Um, so I'll just wrap up fairly quickly, if I may, um, AJ. Um, it's often said that the move to working in virtual chambers will disadvantage trainees and young barristers on the rise because they won't be able to rub shoulders in person with more experienced colleagues. Um, just briefly, I believe that problem can be solved, for instance, by regular daily virtual meetings with the trainee, by sharing documents, sharing screen. And if that's diarized for a daily occurrence, then I think it may even improve the position with uh, trainees and young barristers because it will impose a discipline on the, um, on the senior person to engage daily with the, uh, the trainee or the youngster. Um, and I think that that will be more effective possibly by, by virtual working. Um, <clears throat> So the other elephant in the room, of course, with virtual working is costs. I mean, one of the drivers, not the main driver, but one of the drivers for me in setting up virtual chambers was no longer paying rent on an expensive set of chambers in central London. Um, that simply goes away. And I can hire, for example, at the odd occasion when a client wants a virtual meeting, I beg your pardon, wants an in-person meeting, I can hire meeting rooms in Lincoln's Inn for you know, a fairly reasonable amount of money. Um, so in-person meetings are not ruled out, but one loses the um, often six-figure contribution to expenses um, that one has to bear as a member of an in-person set of barristers. So I've been talking for some time. I hope. I hope I haven't sent you all to sleep. I hope that's been interesting. And um, I'll hand back over to AJ um, to see if we have any questions. Indeed, Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Advocate Patel, you have a question? Mr. Kenning, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Um, Mr. Kenning, firstly, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule in addressing us uh, today here on the South African Bar Association webinar. I have a question. Okay. In, 
I have a question in respect of the human inter interaction element. The first being the interaction between barristers and barristers and the interaction between barristers and solicitors. And uh, from my experiences, being a junior barrister, um, it was, in my first year of experience, um, I don't have an interaction with solicitors as I would have liked due to this pandemic. I know I totally agree with you in terms of being a, uh, of having an experienced individual, having a network, having, having solicitors, knowing the quality and quantity of work that they can potentially do. But interacting with a solicitor that we do not have an interaction with and trying to attain any instruction or any brief from them is very challenging at this moment, especially for young junior barristers. So in that aspect, what do you think would be a remedy for that? And with regards to the barrister and barrister interaction, in the archaic, if I can call it, manner of just walking down the corridor and just knocking on a, on a fellow senior barrister's door, could you put, and you could have an interaction with the barrister on a particular matter, that aspect would be lost by having a virtual chambers per se. Could you perhaps have any remedy for that? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for those questions. Yeah, they're both very important issues and they're, you're not alone in raising those, uh, Mohammed. Um, dealing first with the, the interaction with solicitors. Um, this is the age old problem uh, of how a young barrister acquires instructions from solicitors. Um, I'm not sure that the pandemic or virtual wo uh, working has affected the fundamentals of how you go about doing that. There's no tried and trusted or scientific way that you build up a practice. Um, I mean, the obvious ways are writing articles, doing lectures, getting involved in cases, being led by more senior advocates, networking. Now, of course, the pandemic has made that process more challenging, particularly in-person meetings, you know, social events after a lecture um, and um, professional association meetings and so on and so forth. Um, but that's been the case, I think, across the board. It's not just affected junior barristers and, and how they build a practice. I think it, it simply made the task more challenging and the old ways, you know, writing, lecturing, talking to more senior colleagues, getting them to involve you in their cases, are still the most promising ways to build your practice. I mean, in my own case, very early on, um, I saw that there was a book, a technical tax book that was well out of date. And I simply contacted the publisher and said, look, I'd be interested in updating this. And that was um, more years ago than I care to mention, 1986, actually. Um, and here I am in 2021. I've got a pile of papers behind me, which are the updates for, that, for the next edition of that book. So I'm still doing it. Um, and that helped to consolidate or it helped to establish my reputation as a specialist in certain areas of tax. That was a great help. Now, of course, in-person um, interaction has been hugely affected. But it seems to me with Zoom, Teams, uh, Google Meets, there's nothing to stop you meeting more senior barristers um, on screen. And my old set, I remember they had, um, we had uh, Zoom Chambers tea on two afternoons a week. I don't know if you have anything similar where you are, but in at the English bar, the more traditional sets have Chambers tea. And uh, 
once we went along in the afternoon, maybe at 3.30 for about half an hour, and you talked about anything topical, any tax technical or other technical issues, and any other things that um, people found interesting. And that, that, of course, was a great way to, particularly for junior members, to get more involved with the senior members of the set. Um, now, with Zoom, that continued during the pandemic. And if anything, because it was easier to attend and many chambers, were, many members of chambers are not actually in chambers an awful lot of time pre-pandemic. Post-pandemic, more people made the effort to attend by Zoom simply because it was easy to do so. So th that was a positive. But I, I do agree, uh, Mohammed, that interacting with more senior members um, of your chambers um, will be a challenge because you simply can't walk down the corridor and knock. But the, the Zoom equivalent of walking down the corridor and knocking is calling them uh, via Zoom, asking, say you want to ask them a technical question, you'd be grateful for their advice and do it by Zoom. And uh, most senior members will be open to, uh, to helping with that sort of request. Um, and those that aren't are probably not worth speaking to anyway. So, and then in terms of solicitors, um, well, I've mentioned the traditional ways in which you build a practice. Um, so I won't repeat them. I suppose summing up, yes, it is, it is more of a challenge with the pandemic, but I think adopting a positive and energetic attitude will lead you to adapt the traditional ways of building a practice and interacting with senior members of chambers. Um, and who knows, um, once people get used to those ways of working, those new ways of working, those techniques, they may be as effective or even more effective um, than the traditional ways. Okay. AJ, do we have any further Are there any questions, questions from the audience? You can simply unmute your mic. Um, hi, this is Vijay Melopala. I'm not yet an advocate. I'm still a pupil at Pabasa. And this is not so much, oh, before I continue, thank you so much, Patrick and Ahmed for hosting us on this. We always enjoy these um, exciting topics. But I think for me, it's more for commentary. Um, as you were speaking, I was just writing. As I talk to you right now, I'm sitting during load shedding. Um, so I don't know if you're aware, Patrick, South Africa has, for the past, I'd say, 13 years, we've struggled with electric, our electric grid. And so occasionally, and especially in winter, we have, we have no electricity for maybe two to four hours at a stretch. So what that does for us is that you can even schedule a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting, but then you may end up having no connectivity to actually attend it. And so I think just to add on to what Mohammed is saying, I think that there's a number of things in what he's, he's saying. And, and I think I understand it better because um, I have the privilege of being born in this country. Um, is that obviously South Africa is a very social country from a physical perspective. We love to meet up and talk and that's usually how we connect. And now even the medium that we are supposed to get our name out there. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even junior, I haven't even started. So I am a bit worried about where does that leave me? Because in chambers, I can actually walk down, like Mohammed says, I can walk down the corridor, go into Dumi San Sabenza's offices and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. And that's just one of the challenges we are facing as a country. So that's just load shedding. I think the second challenge is also um, much deeper than that. It's on an economic level in terms of costs of data in South Africa, which are, I was just doing the conversion about four, four what was it? $4.99 pounds, I think. And for us, it's about 88 rand. And whilst it may seem like it's not a lot, if you look at our unemployment rate, that's about 30%, 
it does create a, some sort of a barrier. So sometimes even to help your client out, and I'm not talking about now the solicitor, but let's just say you have to go to court. Um, we had a, an urgent court and it was just sad because people are paying other people to facilitate Zoom meetings for their witnesses who are maybe in a rural area. So unfortunately with our infrastructure, it does pose a bit of a challenge. So I know these are not issues that we can resolve overnight, but it's just something that I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, in terms of yeah. South Africa being where it is as a country. So yeah, I don't think it's even a question. I think it's just thinking out loud to say, it is something that worries me as a person who's gonna go into this profession to say, how am I going to create those connections where even the connective uh, platform, which is Zoom, Teams, it can drop at any moment. Thank you. Well, th thank you, uh, Portomelo. Um, very perceptive comments. Um, <clears throat> electricity outages and the high cost of data, of course, potentially tremendous barriers to virtual working. Um, and I can see why you're concerned about that. Um, I suppose in the medium to long term, as far as the cost of data goes, we have um, people like Elon Musk uh, with his Starlink satellites bringing um, broadband to large parts of the world at reasonable cost, um, where you're not dependent on your local telecoms monopoly and their high prices. And you, you have a much more efficient choice or a choice of efficient low cost broadband. So in the medium to long term, that is something to be hoped for. Um, in the short term, it's difficult really to suggest anything that can be done about this. And it will make um, virtual working much more difficult. Um, as far as the challenge of interacting with other barristers and colleagues goes, I, I do understand what you're saying. And for many, many years, of course, I was in a large set of barristers as it happens, we all had our own room and the tradition was that we, we sat behind closed doors, uh, although one was always able to knock on the door and, and come in and chat, uh, simply for uh, the ability to work quietly um, and fairly intensely. And we had our chambers tea and so on. Um, now, personally, I see the adaption of Zoom, Teams, Google Meets, etc. Positive use of that as replacing the walking down the corridor. Once people become really attuned to screen-based working, it'll become the norm. And for instance, on your mobile phone now, with, for example, Google, instead of calling somebody, you can simply uh, select Google Meets and you do a video call or you do FaceTime. Um, and I think in the social context, that is now becoming the norm. I mean, I, friends and um, family, we FaceTime now rather than speak on the telephone. And my view is it, for what it's worth, is that that will become more of the norm between professional colleagues. Um, and that will, in my view, replace to a large extent the the walk down the corridor or the visit to the water cooler or the coffee machine. But it will take some time for people to adapt to that. So I'm not um, pessimistic about that, but I, I do completely understand that as a senior barrister now with networks, established clients, um, it is fairly, I have to remind myself of the challenges that youngsters face. Um, and so I, I hope I'm not sounding complacent. Um, I'd just like to think if I was in your position now, I would essentially do what I did back then with the same sort of energy and enthusiasm 
And, and really, there's no reason why, in my view, with a positive attitude and energy, one can overcome the apparent obstacles of virtual working. But of course, it does require the senior members as well to take to this with enthusiasm and to make extra allowances to make this structure work. And any, any conscientious senior people with a view to uh, the future of their chambers will, will do that naturally and uh, it is to be hoped. AJ, any, any further any, questions? Any further questions? Okay, Patrick, I think, uh, uh, Patrick, one of the most important take home things which I have gotten from you today is that it appears that, that with virtual working, in person meetings will become the exception rather than the norm. Furthermore, the positive difference between seminars versus webinars and the success in this new environment. And I submit that I concur with you in this regard. Relating to the, to the safety element in view of the harassment issues, unfortunately, this is a tragedy that we face in, in the Republic of South Africa as well. To add on to the safety element, we also face another, uh, uh, an additional element in that regard, which is crime, like most countries, and that is ever so increasing. By way of conclusion, one of the only issues I find with virtual platforms is with regards to today's session, and that being is that we are, if we, <laughs> is that you are unable to hear the round of applause that you would have been given had the session been in a public platform. On behalf of the South African Bar Association and the members of the Republic of South Africa as a whole, I would like to, I would like to thank you for your presentation today. We are exceptionally grateful for what you have told us today. And I am sure many of us will implement your advice within our professions from now on. Once again, we thank you for your time, Patrick. Thank you so much, AJ. And uh, that was very nice of you to refer to virtual applause. <laughs> thank you. Very kind indeed. Thank you, it's thank been you. a pleasure. Cheers, cheers, bye-bye.